Income tax 2023-2024, depreciation. What's new? Resources and property that can and that cannot be depreciated. Get ready and some coffee because we're laying down the facts about income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this info. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Information can be found in Publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers, Listed Property, and more. Tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship schedule C ultimately rolling into line one income of the formula. But remember, in the schedule C, in and of itself is basically an income statement. Having business income minus business expenses, which could also be called business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls in from schedule C to line one of the income tax formula, which is representing, in essence, the calculation on page one of the 1040 that we see here, line number eight, where the schedule C rolls into additional income from schedule one. This is the schedule one, additional income and adjustments to income part number one, additional income, schedule C, roll it into line three, business income or loss. This is the schedule C, profit or loss from business, income statement format, income and expenses, the expenses typically being the place where we have the most different types of categories, although, of course, we hope the dollar of the amount of expenses are lower than the income amount of expenses. The expenses is where we're going to spend our time now, noting that some expenses are going to be more difficult to deal with than others. One of those notoriously are the fixed assets, the depreciable assets, the property, plant, and equipment, remembering that we don't have the balance sheet when we're thinking about a Schedule C business reported for taxes as a sole proprietor. We have a Schedule C, basically an income statement. However, sometimes we're going to need balance sheet accounts if we have to do the accrual thing of putting equipment on the books, for example, as an asset and then depreciating it. So we do have like a balance sheet component that we're going to add to our tax preparation, that being the depreciation schedules giving us the asset accounts of the balance sheet, the contra asset basically calculations of accumulated depreciation, which can help us derive the book value of the property at any given time. And then we're also going to have the depreciation, which is what would be then recorded over here as an expense. Also, just remember that the depreciation is something that even if you have a perfect bookkeeper, you're still going to have to deal with. And it's kind of an accounting thing that we'll have to deal with to make adjustments for depreciation on a tax basis, possibly also calculating it on a book basis if the client also wants that. The software, tax software that is, often has the capability to do that. Okay, so what's new for 2023? 
we've got the section 179 deduction dollar limits. So we're going to go into just some of the changes first, and then we'll dive into the details of uh, depreciation. Now, the 179 deduction is a type of accelerated depreciation where possibly we can get more depreciation up front. It's one of those things that are a big deviation from normal generally accepted accounting principles. In other words, we have to follow the rules of the IRS in order to record and depreciate our property. The IRS basically defaults generally to generally accepted accounting principles, normal accounting standards, and then it deviates from those standards for whatever reason, usually political reasons of some kind, right? And this is one area where that happens. They, they're going to take a lot more depreciation up front. Arguments for that being they're trying to stimulate the economy and do good stuff and whatnot, but obviously it's also popular. And so that's what people try to do to, fa to, get, to gain favor with people who generally I would think would be often from a cynical point of view. That would be what they're trying to do. So for tax years beginning in 2023, the maximum section 179 expense deduction is 1,160,000. So these are things that are going to be contentious uh, legislation. And therefore, the dollar limitations are going to typically need to be adjusted uh, for as inflation changes from year to year. So we'll typically see dollar limitation adjustments for these kind of things. This limit is reduced by the amount by which uh, the cost of Section 179 property placed in service during the tax year exceeds $2,890,000. We'll talk more about that when we get to the 179 deduction specifically. Also, the maximum Section 179 expense deduction for sport utility vehicles placed in service in tax years beginning in 2023 is 28900 So they're going to be limiting certain autos limitations, which we've touched down before and may get into more in detail later. Phase down of special depreciation allowance. So again, this is another one where they, they're basically kind of putting in popular legislation in the argument being to stimulate the economy, although the economy has been somewhat overheated uh, for some time. So it's probably kind of the political thing to do has, a, has some, something to do with it as well. Deviation from basically generally accepted accounting principles, allowing more to be basically expensed up front. We'll talk more about it later, but the special depreciation allowance is 80% for certain qualified property acquired after September 27, 2017 and placed in service after December 31, 2022 and before January 1, 2024 other than certain property with a long uh, production period and certain aircraft. So the special depreciation allowance is also 80% for certain specified plants bearing fruits and nuts planted or grafted after December 31st, 2022 and before January 1st, 2024. See certain qualified property acquired after September 27, 2017 and certain plants bearing fruits and nuts under what is qualified property in chapter three of the publication. Depreciation limits on business vehicles. So as we've saw before, business vehicles are some an area where the IRS is going to be somewhat skeptical because you can see where people might try to have luxury items kind of uh, that aren't really necessary for the business. And it's one of those kind of shady areas where the question is, well, was that, a, did you need a $200,000 car? And so on and so forth. And the, the answer might be, yeah, because I'm trying, I need to make my, I need to look like I'm I'm snazzy, man. That's my, how do I pull in the clients if I don't? Anyways, the total section 179 deduction and depreciation you can deduct for a passenger automobile, including a truck or van you use in your business and first placed in service in 2023 is 20000 200 if the special depreciation allowance applies or 12200 if the special depreciation allowance uh, does not apply. So you can see maximum depreciation duck deductions in chapter five. So we'll talk more about them uh, later when we get to that 179 deduction, talking about it in more detail here. We're looking at those changes. What's new in 2024? So we've looked at 2023 and now we're thinking uh, the 2024 tax year, which of course you would be filing 
in uh, 2025, April 15th, by that time, if filed on time, other than having the extensions, would be the idea. Okay, so again, we would expect then there might be changes with regards to dollar limitations due to, for example, uh, inflation. These are the things that we would expect to be updated for parts of the code that people are quite concerned about, which again includes the Section 179 deduction of dollar limitations. So for tax years beginning in 2024, the maximum Section 179 expense deduction is 1,220,000. This limit is reduced by the amount by which the cost of prop of Section 179 property placed in service during the tax year exceeds 3,050,000. Also, the maximum Section 179 expense deduction for sport utility vehicles placed in service in tax years beginning in 2024 is $30,500. Phase down of special depreciation allowance. The special depreciation allowance is 60%. So now they're phasing out that one. Remember that, well, the idea of these would be that there was makers, which is already an accelerated depreciation method, which we'll talk more in detail later. That's the underlying method. That one makes sense. It's kind of like double declining balance. And then they added the 179, and then they added the special depreciation, which are both kind of overlapping in some ways, giving this greater depreciation up front. And now this special one is phasing out, uh, is phasing out, and that's what you would expect to happen if there was proper litigation with or legislation with regards to the special depreciation and 179s because the argument for those is that they are used to stimulate the economy when necessary from like a Keynesian economic perspective and then when the economy is overheating you would think that they would back them off but in practice of course they are popular to keep doing right to keep to because because the 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 business environment's going to want more of the upfront deductions. So it's in practice, uh, it's difficult for politicians not to just keep updating and increasing the amount of upfront deductions, right? So that, that's why the Keynesian model doesn't always work in practice because the politicians don't have the incentives to, to disincentivize or, un, or slow down the economy when it's overheating. But this one is phasing out here. So the special depreciation allowance is 60%, unless they change it, <laughs> for certain qualified property acquired after September 27, 2017 and placed in service after December 31st, 2023 and before January 1st, 2025, uh, other than certain property with a long-term production period and certain aircraft. Okay, property with a long a uh, production period and certain aircraft placed in service after December 31st, 2023 and before January 1st, 2025 is eligible for a special depreciation allowance of 80% of depreciable basis of the property. The special depreciation allowance is also 60% for certain specified plants bearing fruits and nuts planted or grafted after December 31st, 2023 and before January 1st, 2025. You can see certain qualified property acquired after September 27, 2017 and certain plant bearing fruits and nuts under what is qualified property in chapter number three. Definitions. So we've got uh, many of the terms used in this publication are defined in the glossary at the end of the publication. So we'll try to, of course, touch on some of the terminology as we go through some of these ideas with regards to depreciation, mainly being the standard depreciation makers and then 179 and special depreciation. Uh, glossary terms used in each discussion under the major headings are listed before the beginning of each discussion through the publication. Now, we might not list out all of the terms as we kind of go through each of the discussions, but rather discuss and touch on those terms as we're uh, going through the presentation. But if you want to take a look at the publication and <clears throat> look up those terms, uh, then we'll provide you with that. Or you can find it, of course, at the IRS website, iris.gov, iris.gov, and look at those glossary of key terms. Do you need a different publication? So the following table shows where you can get more detailed information when depreciation certain types of property. So clearly depreciation is a huge topic. Some 
you know, depreciation is, is somewhat more standardized towards small to mid-sized businesses, but some types of things are going to be more specific towards more types of industries. So as a tax preparer, our question often will be, what kind of industries do we want to take on as clients? How much do we want to be dealing with their bookkeeping and things uh, like that? And the complication of depreciation is something that we might want to take into consideration. So for example, gig work people and whatnot probably don't have a whole lot of property and equipment because it's a service business. They've got their microphone and their whatever, but it's probably not going to be too difficult to do a Schedule C of that type given just because of the depreciable property. But when you get to larger businesses, such as construction businesses, for example, they're probably going to have more types of equipment and then depreciation becomes more important and different types of depreciation become more important. Being able to categorize property that should be depreciated versus leased property uh, could, could become uh, important. And then when you get into types of of businesses that deal with real estate, then the depreciable property takes on a, a, a whole nother kind of dimension that's really important there because then you got to figure out what should be applied to the land versus the building and how long should the thing be depreciated over and when things are improved upon, what's going to be the type of depreciation that should be applied? Could you have a shorter years of depreciation as opposed to a longer depreciation cycle? So for each of those items, we've got a car. So you've got the publication 463 travel, gift and car expenses. Now the car is one that even for small businesses is always going to be kind of an issue for us. Although for many, many Schedule C businesses, possibly if they're just using their own car, you might be able to use the mileage method, in which case you, you might not have to deal with the whole depreciation thing there either. But it's always going to be a question that kind of comes up and you want to keep in mind the actual depreciation versus the mileage method and be able to explain why you would choose the mileage method versus the actual depreciation method in a given situation. Residential rental property, uh, 527 residential rental property. Obviously, rental property is going to deal heavily with depreciation because that's, that's going to be a major uh, type of expense rental property is its own kind of thing we might do another course or section on uh details of rental property which might not always be recorded on uh the schedule c but possibly on a schedule e that's one of our questions with income does it need to be subject to self-employment tax which means it would be on the schedule c or possibly not if it's on the schedule e it might be more passive but the passive property also could be subject to passive loss limitations were which could be a problem in some cases office space in your home uh, 587 business use of your home this is one that comes up oftentimes for small businesses the home could be a rental property or it could be a home that they own and are paying a mortgage on either way then if part of the home uh well it could if it's a rental property then you don't actually own the home, but you have rent on the property and are dealing with that home office and the rent expense, which possibly is a little bit easier. If you own the home, then you, you have the interest that you're paying on the, on the mortgage, the property taxes, and you have the, the value of the home that you paid for that the amount applied to the to to your office might be something to be depreciable, which again gets a little bit messy because obviously you paid for the home in terms of one lump sum for the entire home, but you can only basically depreciate the amount that's going to be used for the for your office. So we'll, we might dive into the business use of your, your home in more detail uh, later. And then farm property, uh, 225 Farmers Tax Guide. Now farm property, notice again, farms have their own, the tax laws often have deviations and specializations so if you're dealing with with farming uh, information that's a specialty field that you might do well in specializing in if you're not specialized in it you might have to do a lot of research to make sure you're picking up the right stuff or possibly not go into that specialization again part of what you need to do in my opinion as a tax preparer is be able to tell clients which clients you're going to pick up and which clients you are not going to pick up which is going to cause people to be upset with you sometimes 
but that's the way it is. This is how my business is, okay? This is what you can't do for them, clients. No, I, it's just not my thing, okay? It's not my thing, all right? Bis, bis, I could do it if I wanted to, but I, but that's not what I do. Anyway, useful items, publications. You've got uh, 534, depreciable, depreciating property placed in service before 1987. Publication 538, accounting periods and methods. Publication 551, business uh, basis of assets. The basis of the assets is kind of like the cost the, the of the asset and then the adjusted basis that's going to be adjusted over time. The basis becomes important because remember, the idea would be we have to put the, the item on the books as an asset, but at some point we're going to have to take it off the books because we're going to use the forklift, let's say it's a forklift, for whatever, five years, and then we're going to dispose of it or sell it or something with it, and we're going to have to take it off the books. When we take it off the books, if we sell it, then I'm going to have to figure out what the adjusted basis is so I can figure if there's any gain or loss on it. And that adjusted basis is going to have to take into account the accumulated depreciation, the depreciation over the life of the property, which is further complicated with the special depreciation 179 deductions because one, that, that complicates the depreciation calculation and how to categorize those things. And two, it makes it more likely that we over depreciated and therefore we'll sell it at a gain. And that also results in, in the question of should it be a capital gain versus an ordinary income gain? And because we over depreciated it, we got ordinary income depreciation. So what should we, so, so, so that gets kind of messy. We'll touch in on that. But just want to point out that anytime we put something on the books as depreciable property, we want to clearly identify it so that we can then figure out what the adjusted basis is when it is disposed of. If we can't figure out the forklift that we actually physically disposed of where it is on the depreciation schedule, we're going to run into a mess, right? And so we want to be clear and precise from the get go from the start. Okay, form and instructions. You got the Schedule C, Form 1040, profit or loss from a business. So we can look at that form, obviously. Uh, 21, form 2106, employee business expenses. Form 3115, application for change in accounting method. So in other words, depreciation is another one of those items where it's gonna last a while. So if you buy equipment and you put it on the books, depreciating it over five years, then you got to stick with that depreciation method typically unless there's some for some reason you have some kind of change or adjustment or or fixing of the depreciation because it was put on there incorrectly in other words if you put it on there using the wrong method then how do you deal with that right because you now you're gonna have to kind of change the accounting method uh, which is a little bit different of a problem than when you sell the property which is kind of part of the standard course of operations, but you'll have to deal with gains or losses on the sale. Okay. So, and then you got the form 4562 depreciation and amortization. Uh, terms you may need to know. So we've got the adjusted basis. That's kind of like the cost when we buy it, but then we have to adjust it. One of the major things we adjust it for is decreasing the basis as we record the depreciation because we are in essence getting a benefit from a tax standpoint of the cost as an expense or deduction over the useful life of the business. That means that the basis we would like to have as high as possible because that means that we have potential to depreciate it over time. Or in other words, I would rather write off the entire basis typically up front, lowering the basis to zero, but getting the benefit in year one. That's kind of what we're doing with the 179 deductions and special depreciations. But when I sell the property, I want the basis to be as high as possible and from the starting point because that's going to make my my gain less or my my loss greater and so 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 the basis becomes important like if there's inheritance or something like that and we don't know how much we bought it for we would want to have it on the books for a larger basis because that's going to allow us to depreciate it more and that's where these kind of questions come in you know with the basis all right so there, then there's the normal basis, uh, commuting. So we talked about commuting miles when you're driving to and from your, your standard place of business versus uh, elsewhere. 
which could have an impact on your business miles that you can possibly deduct for auto expenses. Uh, dispositions, when we dispose of items like property, plant, and equipment, it, we might treat it similar to a sale, for example, but we just disposed of it. We didn't get any income for it. Fair market value. So that's going to be the idea of what we would sell something for if we had someone else that would be purchasing it without coercion. You don't have a gun to their head or anything. Free market transaction. What would be the fair market price, which is difficult with property, plants, and equipment because property, plants, and equipment is unique as opposed to stocks, for example, which we can see are trading on the stock exchange if they're publicly traded. So fair market value becomes more of a complex concept, especially when you're dealing with like real estate or something. Uh, intangible property, property that you can't actually touch. So like copyrights, for example, are things that we would amortize, but they're really like a legal right. Uh, listed property. So these are certain assets uh, that are used for personal use in a business. One of the most common examples being like an automobile, but possibly like cell phones and computers and so on. And those could have some impact on the depreciation of them. Uh, placed in service. So when we put the property, plant and equipment in service, which is gonna be important because that's gonna calculate, help us calculate our depreciation for the first year, which might be a part of a year, which might be like half of the year, given the normal makers, which is the common half year convention. Uh, tangible property, property that you can touch and kick and whatnot, equipment, for example, versus intangible property that are usually based on laws like a copyright. Uh, term interest, so we have the interest and then the useful life is gonna be how long uh, the, the life of the property is. So, and this is gonna be something that's going to be more strict for the tax code because remember that if we're talking about generally accepted accounting principles and I bought a forklift, the idea would be I want to make my financial statements as accurate as possible for internal and external decision making. Therefore, I have an incentive to come up with a useful life that makes the most sense to depreciate the or to depreciate the cost over that useful life. For taxes, however, I have an incentive to depreciate as much as I can up front. It's not about fair reporting. It's about, it's about for, for the taxpayer to try to pay as little taxes as possible. Therefore, the IRS has to be more stringent in terms of saying, this is what you are going to depreciate it over. These are, this will be the terms of the useful life. So we'll talk about that. Uh, you can depreciate most types of tangible property except land, such as building, machinery, vehicles, furniture, and equipment. You can also depreciate certain intangible property, such as patents, copyrights, and computer software. To be depreciable, the property must meet all of the following requirements. It must be property you own. So you don't lease it, you own it, although we saw some ideas of having a capital lease versus an operating lease where it's basically ownership in reality substance over form although the lease so we might get into that more later it must be used in your business uh business or income producing activity so obviously if we have the forklift and we're going to write it off it's because we're using the forklift in the business or for example if i have a car and i'm writing it off for the business it's because i'm using the car in the business if i'm just driving around in my car like cruising the strand then that uh, shouldn't be a, a write-off, you would think. But that's how, I, that's how I draw on my clients, man. I look cool driving around. Okay. It must have a determinable useful life. So obviously, we're going to have to be able to determine what the useful life will be, which, obvious, which once again will be dictated oftentimes by the tax code in a more structured way than possibly generally accepted accounting principles. It must be expected to last more than one year which is why we are depreciating it because we're going to be using it to help us generate revenue, not just in the first year of operation, but multiple years into the future. Property you own. To claim depreciation, you must usually be the owner of the property. You are considered as owning property, even if it is subject to debt. So clearly, if you own it, you bought it, you bought the forklift. Well, then you own it. However, sometimes questions come up in terms of, did I lease it? or did I buy it? 
And again, we could have questions that it's structured as a lease, but actually the lease is a capital lease. So it's kind of like you bought it. And so th there's that confusion. And then there's confusion in terms, some people will say, well, I don't own it because I have debt on it. And you'll often hear people say this with regards to their home, for example, they'll say, yeah, the bank owns half of my home or the bank owns 80% of my home, which, which I, which you could also apply that logic to like equipment, but that's not actually true. That's people kind of being overly, uh, they're, 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 they're making a claim that's over the top when they're saying that that's what usually is happening. And then people actually kind of took that seriously. And the, and the reason it's a difference is because no, what happened is you took a loan out from the bank to buy the home possibly, and then you're using the home as collateral for the loan. And so you might say, well, that's the same thing. The bank owns 80% of my home, but they don't because they have no say over what you do with the home. When you paint the home, the bank doesn't come in and say, Hey, look, I want you to paint it. I want you to paint it yellow or whatever. Uh, I want you to paint it orange. I want the bank doesn't have any say over that. If you want to paint your home yellow, then, then that's your say, even though the bank has, you have to, you owe the bank 80% in a loan and your home is, is the, is the lever is the collateral on the loan. The only time the bank comes into play is if you don't pay off the loan and then, and then the home is recourse in that case, and they could have the ability to foreclose. But that's a huge difference between they have the ability to foreclose in the event that you don't pay off your loan than to them owning the property. Because if they owned it, again, they would have a lot of say over how you're going to use the property. All right, I just want to point that out because again, I get, I, th I feel like a lot of people actually don't really understand that difference. And uh, the same thing could be applied to equipment. So if you have business equipment like a forklift, you might have a business loan and the equipment is collateral on it uh, in a similar way as your home is collateral on the mortgage debt, right? So example one, so you made a down payment to purchase rental property and assume the previous owner's mortgage. You own the property and you can depreciate it. Example two, you bought a new van that will use only for your uh, courier business. You will be making payments on the van over the next five years. You own the van and you can depreciate it. All right, leased property. You can depreciate leased property only if you retain the incidence of ownership in the property explained below. These, this means you bear the burden of exhaustion of the capital investment in the property. So this is where it gets confusing on the lease versus purchase side of things. If you leased it, it you would think you rented it and therefore you would expense the rental payments rather than putting it on the books as an asset and depreciating it. But if basically the, the rental or lease agreement is such that you might as well have purchased it, then the argument is in substance, it's actually a purchase and therefore should be depreciated rather than being cost because you do not retain the incidence of ownership. You can, however, depreciate any capital improvements you make to the property. You can see how to, how do you treat repairs and improvements later in this chapter and additions and improvements under which recovery period applies. So in other words, you might have some property, say like an office building that, that you're renting but you don't have incidents of ownership. You're basically just leasing it. But sometimes the lease periods for, for businesses are much different than individuals where you might rent it year to year or something. You might be leasing business property for like 20 years. And therefore you might, for example, in this property, knock out all the walls. So you have this huge open space, which could cost quite a bit of money. So although you don't own the office space here, you do own the, the changes that you made to it, right? The changes that you made within it that you might depreciate uh, uh, over whatever the useful life would be for, that, for those changes. So if you lease property to someone, you can generally depreciate its cost even if the lease, the person leasing from you has agreed 
to preserve, replace, renew, and maintain the property. However, if the lease provides that the, that the leasee is to maintain the property and return you the same property or its equivalent in value at the expiration of the lease in as good condition and value as when leased, you cannot depreciate the cost of the property. So in other words, if you lease property to someone else, you would think part of the agreement might be the other person is going to upkeep the property and, and keep it in good condition, in which case you'd say, well, maybe I shouldn't be depreciating it because, because they're going to basically be upkeeping it. But typically, you'd, you'd still possibly be able to depreciate it. And then there's a question of whether or not there's income related to them doing that upkeep in terms of how it's negotiated for the rental agreement, possibly. However, if the lease provides that the leasee is to maintain the property and return to you the same property or its equivalent in value at the expiration of the lease in as good condition and value as when leased, you cannot depreciate the cost of the property. All right, incidents of ownership. Incidents of ownership in property include the following, the legal title to the property. So obviously if it's a car or if it's a home, you're gonna have to, you have typically legal title. The legal obligation to pay for the property. So clearly if you paid for the property upfront or are due to pay it because you have a loan taken out, then you would think that you own it. The responsibility to pay maintenance and operating expenses. So if you're the one that takes care of the car or the building, then you would think that you would be the owner of it because the owner is typically the one that has to do that kind of thing. The duty to pay any taxes on the property. So clearly if you own a home or a car or something like that and you're paying the property taxes on it, then typically you would think you would be the owner of it because th that's who usually pays the property tax. The risk of loss if the property is destroyed, condemned, or d uh, diminished in value through obsolescence or exhaustion. So you're the one that's going to bear the consequences if the property is destroyed for whatever reason and therefore has an incentive not to have it destroyed. So, so life tenant generally if you hold a uh, business or investment property as a life tenant, you can depreciate it uh, as if you were the absolute owner of the property. So this is somewhat of an unusual situation where you, you have a, a basically a tenant, you know, for life. So they're going <laughs> to, so they're going to own it for life. However, and then possibly at death, you would think it might revert at the time of death. That's not unusual type of situation, normal, but might be in some cases. However, see certain term uh, interests in property under accepted property later property used in your business or income producing activity to claim depreciation on property you must use it in your business or income producing activity so you have to obviously again use the forklift to to do stuff in the business to help generate revenue you would think that's why you have it so if you use property to produce income, investment use, the income must be taxable. So you cannot depreciate property that you use solely for personal activities. So again, if you have that car that you're just cruising on the strand with, then you're not usually using it to drive to clients and whatnot, then you think it wouldn't be deductible. So partial business or investment use. This is one of the major problems that come up is the breaking out of something that's personal versus business. We would like to do that as cleanly as possible, but clearly there are still some areas where that's difficult to separate. So if you use property for business or investment purposes and for personal purposes, you can deduct depreciation based only on the business or investment use. We saw this a little bit with the automobile, which is a common example. If you're depreciating the automobile, then you might have to determine business versus personal use. You can only depreciate the business part of it. For example, you cannot deduct depreciation on a car used only for commuting, personal shopping trips, family vacations, driving children to and from school or similar activities. Office in the home. So if you use part of your home as an office, you may be able to deduct depreciation on that part based on its business use. We might talk more about this later, but remember that if you have an office home and you're renting your home, then you might be allocating the rent of the home because you don't own it, but that still could be significant. If you own the home, 
then you would think the cost of the purchase of the home might be depreciable for the amount that's allocated to uh, the business in a similar way than if you bought an office, for example. For information about depreciation in your home, you can see publication 587. Property having a determinable useful life. So to be depreciable, your property must have a determinable useful life. This means that it must be something that wears out, decays, gets used up, becomes obsolete, or loses its value from natural causes. That's most equipment, the exception being land, for example. So whenever we buy rental or actual real estate, we have to break it out typically between the building, which does deteriorate over time, and the land, which does not, at least in human lifetimes. What property cannot be depreciated? Terms you may need to know. So we've got amortization, the basis we talked about before, goodwill, uh, we might touch on that, intangible property, remainder interest, and term interest. All right, land. So you cannot depreciate the cost of land because land does not wear out, become obsolete, or get used up. The cost of land generally includes the cost of clearing, grading, planting, and landscaping. So there becomes some questions, some confusions about when you buy real estate, how much should be allocated to the building versus the land, which can become somewhat of a complex uh, situation in and of itself. But so so we might get in, that's kind of a specialized topic although you cannot depreciate land you can depreciate certain land pre preparation costs such as landscaping costs incurred for preparing land for business use these costs must be so closely associated with other depreciable property that you can determine a life for them along with the life of the associated property so now you're talking about things that you're dealing with with the land which are closely associated you think they rise and fall with the property such as for example the building which is the depreciable item example so you construct a new building for use in your business and paid for grading clearing seeding and planting bushes and trees some of the bushes and trees were planted right next to the building while others were planted around the outer border of the lot so if you replace the building you would have to destroy the bushes and trees right next to it. So that's the idea would be that the bushes and trees now are kind of part or an extension of the building given the proximity of them and therefore possibly depreciable because of that proximity, whereas they would not be when they're on the outer edges. Those bushes and trees are closely associated with the building, so they have a determinable useful life. So therefore, you can depreciate them and uh, add your other land preparation costs to the basis of your land because they have no determinable life and you cannot depreciate them. Property placed in service and disposed of in the same year. Determining when property is placed in service is explained later. So equipment used to build capital improvements. You must add otherwise allowable depreciation on the equipment during the period of construction to the basis of your improvements. You can see uniform capitalization rules, publication 551. Somewhat of a specialized area is when, of course, we are constructing the property because then everything that we're doing should be you would think capitalized as part of of the property in the construction period for the most part section 197 intangibles you must amortize these costs intangible properties such as certain computer software that is not section 197 intangible property can be depreciated if it meets certain requirements you can see intangible property later certain term interests related persons for a description of related persons, you can re see related persons later. For, th for this purpose, however, treat as related persons only the relationships listed in items 1 through 10 of that discussed and substitute 50% for 10% each place uh, it appears. So the general idea with the related persons is that, of course, we don't have an arm's length transaction as we would expect in a normal kind of business free market type of transaction and therefore there's got to be special rules because people that are related persons might do kind of funny things in order to have tax benefits right so uh, basis adjustments 
So if you would be allowed a depreciable uh, deduction for a term interest in property, except that the holder of the remainder interest is related to you, you must generally reduce the basis in the term interest by any depreciation or amortization not allowed. If you held the remainder interest, you must generally increase your basis in that interest by the depreciation not allowed to the term interest holder. So notice this relationship between the depreciation and the adjusted basis. So remember, if the, if the adjusted basis is higher, we usually like the adjusted basis to be high because that allows us then to depreciate it over time. And then, and then also when we sell it to have less of a, of a gain at the point of sale. However, of course, we would like to then take that, that tax benefit that's being represented in the basis as soon as possible. So in other words, if I had the opportunity to take all that tax benefit from the high adjusted basis today and just expense it as depreciation or something, then typically that's what a taxpayer would want to do all else equal to take the benefit as soon as possible. So you have this interplay then between the IRS allowing you to take the deduction today and the adjusted basis which will have an impact later when you're either able to depreciate it later or possibly when you sell it in the form of having a gain or loss at that point. However, do not increase your basis for depreciation not allowed for periods during which either of the following situation applies. The term interest is held by an organization exempt from tax. The term interest is held by a non-resident alien individual or foreign corporation and the income from the term interest is not effectively connected with the conduct of a trade or business in the United States. Exceptions. The above rules uh, do not apply to the holder of a term interest in property acquired by gift, bequeathed, or inheritance. So they also do not apply to holder of dividend rights that were separated from any stripped preferred stock if the rights were purchased after April 30th, 1993, or to a person whose basis in the stock is determined by reference to the basis in the hands of the purchasers. So that's somewhat of an unusual situation.